that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the 531st edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell. In the flesh, but not in the studio. That's the way it always is these days. I got to talk you into coming to, into the studio again one of these days. Okay, the dates that we're going to be talking about are start on the 6th of July. And okay. They, and they end on the 12th of July. And this show is labeled the 13th of July, but in fact, it's being recorded on the 17th of July because the studio was closed on the 13th. Yeah. So if that is uh, sufficiently confusing uh, to everybody, we can go ahead out of the confusion. If we you didn't say anything, I don't think anybody would have noticed. Okay. This uh, material all comes from my blog, geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. People who are interested in following up, uh, reading on the stories that we, Tom and I talk about can do so by going to geoharvey.com and finding the appropriate date or by taking one of the, um, uh, by clicking on one of the things that you'll find farther down on the page here if you're looking on a computer. One of them is a file that can be downloaded with live links. The other is a um, blog that Tom and I use to to uh, put the show together with live links. They should, it's got links on it. So it's it, got links. Okay, I guess we should. Links work. And, and while I'm while I'm I'm at it, we don't have time to talk about all of the stuff that's in oh, those links. Oh, There's really good man. stuff there. Yeah, there so is. Time is is worthwhile clicking on some of them. Yeah. Okay, we're going to start by talking about Napa Valley which is why we have start with a picture of Napa Valley. Amazing. Amazing, isn't it? It's, it's, it's really kind of amazing how these things come together. It's almost like magic instead of a coincidence. Okay, this is a story from the BBC. What do you got, Tom, for a title? Californian winemakers learning firefighting techniques. Yeah, you got to learn more than just how to make wine. Northern California's Napa Valley had a historic wildfire fire season in 2020. The first blaze erupted in August, consuming hundreds of thousands of acres and killing five people. Vineyard owners had to adapt to learn not only firefighting techniques, but also how to deal with wine flavored by smoke. Doesn't, That's interesting. Wine flavored by smoke. It doesn't sound very appetizing, does it? No, but it might be. I think it depends. Um, I, you know, it's funny how things work sometimes. I mean, you have ham that's flavored with smoke and turkey that's flavored with smoke. Yeah, right. You, maybe you could do something with wine flavored with smoke. So I kind of have a feeling that the winemakers were not delighted by it. Okay. Doesn't sound good, but who knows? Yeah. Okay, I don't drink much wine, so I, I know nothing. Um, our next... Item comes from Clean Technica. There's a picture of a Caterpillar um, electric truck. Is that it, truck is huge. Uh, uh, the, the, the tires are bigger than a man is tall. I think, the, you know, Tom, I have a feeling that if I walked up to that truck and looked at the axle, I'd be looking it right in the eye. I think that would be Pretty just... So. Well, you can see from the front of the truck there's a ladder. Yeah. And that's about human high. Yeah. And there's there's a, a a set of stairs that you can lower on the left side of that thing on the on the front so that you can walk. I mean, basically, oh, the, yeah, the, absolutely. The uh, the cab of that truck is two stories off the ground. I was just going to say that's a two story stairway. Yeah. Okay. What do you got for a title? Australian mining companies chose battery electric over hydrogen fuel cell mining trucks. Yeah. And this, by the way, comes from Clean Technica. That's right. Both batteries and fuel cells provide the electricity needed to run electric motors. So which is better? The companies have done their research. 
For them, the, them being the mining companies, the answer is clear. Battery powered mining trucks are the way to go. Why? Because of efficiency. Now, well, a couple of weeks ago, we read an article about trucks like this. And when they were rolling downhill, they, they were, were generating power, which they absorbed. Yeah. So they were back up. They, so they were basically free, free energy. Yeah. They yeah. were recharging the batteries by rolling downhill. Bingo. Now, because they would go uphill with a load of, of, of ore and downhill empty, it took more power to get them uphill than down. So they would need, reach the end of the day with less electricity, electric energy than what they started with. And nevertheless, it's a good deal. Now, you can, there are fuel cells that can charge, uh, they can make a, a hydrogen as they, by, by kind of running in reverse, but I don't think they're using those in vehicles. I don't think they're very efficient. And by the way, why are these battery uh, uh, batteries being used? Because of efficiency. I want to tell everybody there are certain things, certain words that are just flags. And when you hear them, you should think, what does that mean? And the, the thing that I always say about efficiency is you don't know what efficiency means unless you know what it means. And uh, yeah, because efficiency, I asked a nuclear engineer once how efficient the Vermont Yankee plant was. And he said it's 35% efficient. And then he went on to say, but thermal plants are always around 35% efficient. There are laws of thermodynamics that mean that that's the best efficiency you can get. Which, by the way, is the reason why two thirds of the energy that came from splitting atoms at Vermont Yankee went into heating up the Connecticut River or the atmosphere. And I you don't get paid for doing that. What? You don't get paid for doing that. No, you don't. And he was, he, you know, was sorrowful that the energy that was used, you know, that came off of that nuclear reaction wasn't being used in, in Greenfield and Brattleboro and so forth to heat homes. He said... Vermont Yankee produced enough waste heat to heat every home in, in Vermont. I believe that. Yeah. And I said, you know, I think you're wrong. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I think that you're operating at less than 1% efficiency. Wow. And, and he said, why? And I said, because you only use f uh, less than 5% of the fuel at 35% efficiency. And in fact, you're using more like 2% of the fuel, which means wow. that you're at 35% of 2%, and that's less than 1%. And his <laughs> response to that was, well, that's one way you can look at it. It's so like I said, you don't know what efficiency means unless you know what it means. Okay, you ready to move on, Tom? I think we can move on. We've got a picture here of some lion glass. Lion Never glass. That is not lying, that is lie on. I, exactly. And you know, when I saw this, I thought, lithium glass? Lithium ion glass? No. That is lying like the cat. It's, near, oh, it's got nothing to do with lithium, huh? It has nothing to do with lithium. It, the cat is the, um, is the mascot. The lion is the mascot of Penn State University. Aha, uh -huh. so they called it after the mascot. That's right. What do you got for a title? Penn State's new lion glass is 10 times tougher and has half the carbon emissions. Yeah. This well, that's is, very interesting. It is. This is from Clean Technica. Penn State University announced a new product, lion glass, which is 10 times more resistant to damage than soda lime silicate glass. And it uses about half the energy to manufacture because the melting temperature is, uh, te temperature is are lowered by about 300 to 400 degrees Celsius. So this is a triple header. I think it is, yeah, it is. Although you never can tell about these things. You know, there are many physical properties that you might be interested in. In this case, they wanted to crack the glass and they put 10 times as much effort into cracking the glass as would crack uh, the regular glass, soda lime silicate glass. 
um, but it wasn't enough to crack this stuff. And they couldn't actually tell how much tougher it was because their equipment only measured up to 10 times as tough. So it seems like if a window gets hit, gets hit by a baseball, it's not going to break. Well, yeah, but remember, glass is extremely hard, and yet yes. it fractures very easily. Yes. So, as I said, there's di there are different kinds of physical um, characteristics that you can look at. Okay, we're up to Friday, July 7th, and what do you say about that, Tom? Well, there's a picture there where it looks like a solar field, but it's not. <laughs> That's right. State regulators approve XL Energy's plan for battery storage in Becker. Yeah, this is uh, from a site called MPR News. The Minnesota Public Utilities Commission unanimously approved an XL Energy project that will test a 10 megawatt form energy iron air battery system. XL oh, that picture is a battery. That is a battery. That's, wow. That's a battery. Now, this is that. That won't fit my flashlight. What? Won't fit in my flashlight. No, it will not. That's right. In fact, it would not fit in my driveway. Um, the, um, uh, let me continue with it, with the synopsis. XL expects it, it will begin operating in late 2025. The system will be able to support, uh, to store a 100 hour supply. Um, supply of energy. Now, the picture that you're seeing is not the battery system that they approved. Um, the, the, the picture is a 56 megawatt battery. The battery they approved is a 10 megawatt battery, so it's pretty small. Oh, their, their picture is much smaller than this picture. That's correct. But the thing that's interesting about this, I mean really interesting, is that it is a 100-hour supply. That's, okay. a good, that, that's a good amount of time. It is. Yeah. That means that the battery can, can generate its full potential output for 100 hours straight before you, it can't generate anymore. And that's kind of important. But the other thing that's important about this battery system, this is an iron-air battery. Um, and that means that the raw material that is used in this battery is iron. It's not lithium, it's not cobalt, it's not nickel, it's not any of that, it's iron. So it's a lot cheaper to make. Yeah, and the way that it works is as the electricity is drawn from it, the iron produces the power by rusting. I was just gonna say that's rust, isn't it? That's yeah. rust. Now, when you, what they've done is they've designed the battery so that if you put electricity into it, the rust... It unrusts. It unrusts. Yeah. That's exactly correct. Very cool kind of thing. So, I guess we should go on, huh? Well, there's a lot of smart people working on stuff all around the world, and some of this stuff is going to be significant. Yeah, and I think that iron air battery system is one of the things that's likely to be significant. I think so. Okay, our next picture is a picture of surface air temperature anom anomalies for June starting, I don't know, it looks like 1978. Um, and this is from CNN. It's interesting to see how blue it is on the left and how red it is <laughs> on the right. Yeah, one thing that we should note here about the picture is that the uh, reference period is 1991 to 2020. And by 1991, the world had already started to get uh, heated up from, from yep. climate change. So th this is, um, if you had picked the average temperature of 1930 to 1970, something like that, you'd have that whole... Um, Oh, there'd be very little on this graph that would be blue. It would all, the, the line... It would be red. Yeah, it would all be red. Almost all. The, there would be blue areas off on the left, but not much of them. Okay, what do you got? This is an interesting title. Yeah. Last month was the planet's hottest June on record by a huge margin. Yes, and you can see it there. 
look at that on the on the right end of the screen. That's a yeah, very, very tall bar compared to everything that came before. Um, Earth's temperature was off the charts in June, and analysis by the EU's Copernicus Climate Change Service found that last month was the hottest June by a, quote, substantial margin, end quote. I always want to pronounce that margarine. By a su substantial margarine <laughs> above the pre previous record. The nine hottest Junes, ha nine hottest Junes have all occurred during the last nine years. Am I seeing a trend <laughs> here? What? Am I seeing a trend here? Uh, maybe. You never can tell. Yep. Okay, should we go on? I mean, I think, I think we've made the point on this that there's a trend already. Okay? Yep. Okay. Now, um, we have a picture of the United States. I'll put it up. And what we're seeing here is areas, uh, you know, of um, interconnection, uh, electrical inter interconnection, and uh, the likelihood that they are going to fail. So the red is more likely to fail than the gray. That's right. Now, there's two levels of red, and I, I only see the lighter level of red. The high risk I don't see anywhere on the map. I might be wrong. But... Um, this I'm is, seeing it like you are. I, I don't really know. Yeah, this is from Clean Technica. High summer heat means two thirds of North America is at risk of energy shortfalls. If temperatures spike this summer, huh, they have already spiked this summer, thank you very much. Parts of the United States could face electricity sh supply shortages. The latest summer reliability uh, report from NERC um, warns that two-thirds of North America is at risk of energy shortfalls this summer in times of extremely high electricity demand. And, and when do you get a lot of a high electricity cement demand? During a heat wave. That's right. Yeah. Or during the winter, during a cold uh, cold. Yeah, but talking about summer. That's but what I the, meant. The real, the real problem is during the summer, and um, that's so, something to bear in mind, I guess. Okay, we should move on. We're we're lagging a little bit. Okay, we have a picture of monopiles, and what I want to do is I want to start out by pointing out that the monopiles that you see there are pretty big. The one that's closest to the camera, which is the lowest one, is on a trailer. Look at all the tires on that trailer. I, I can't write, I can't really, I guess I can see it, yeah. It's, There's it's, the ti it's, trailers, the tires look tiny. They do, yeah, that's why I didn't, didn't notice them. You but didn't right, notice all them. All along the middle of the bottom is all tires. It's all tires. <laughs> I had a picture of something that looked like this, but it was from a, from a closer uh, view, and it was from an angle. And what I saw was that each of those tires that you see there is actually two tires on one side, and there's two on the other. And the trailer that I saw had 128 tires on it. And if you look at toward the toward the very near the bottom of that, just left of of the center vertical, there is a little thing, and that little thing is a guy. A little orange thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, a guy in an orange suit, isn't it? It is. At least that's what it looks like. Maybe it's wow. a girl in an orange suit. What do you think? Now these things are what supports a turbine. That's right. That's and this uh, article comes from Clean Technica. So what do you have? New Jersey's zombie offshore wind industry finally sees the light of day. Yeah. New Jersey inched one step closer to its first offshore wind farm when a helpful tax bill squeaked through the legislature by the skin of its teeth. Passage of the bill would should help launch the 1,100 megawatt Ocean Wind One project, though there still may be trouble. Well, that's 1.1 gigawatts, and so you've heard me say that gigawatts is bigawatts. That's right, it is. I have heard you say that, Tom. I, this I is will... significant. Yeah. yeah, there are lawsuits yeah. that are trying to prevent this, this wind farm from going up. 
And um, frankly, I'm distressed by that because we need the electricity. We need to shut these fossil fuel plants down. So, okay. What's that? Stranded assets. Stranded assets. Yeah, there are people who are very resistant to uh, the idea of any renewable energy coming online. And there are people they will support who, you know, will take it, take the... um, Issue. Okay, our next item is from BBC World. It is a model of a sailing ship, huh? That's what it is. You can see... I've, I've there, seen something like this before with cylindrical sails. Yeah, well, these are, these are sails that are shaped like the wing of an airplane. They don't move except to, except to uh, take advantage of the, of the wind. They aren't those... They, Kind of an airfoil shape, huh? That's right. And this is a model. That that other boat there has got two guys standing on it. And, and the question is, what would net zero shipping look like? Yeah. At a United Nations summit, countries agreed to curb shipping emissions to net zero, quote, by or around 2050, end quote. Shipping is a highly polluting industry producing nearly 3% of total emissions. If it were a country... The shipping industry would be the sixth largest polluter in the world. Well, if you look at shipping, particularly from places like China to places like the United States, they're crossing vast areas of ocean. Right. And they're using fuel. Yep. And they don't need to use fuel. And and the fuel that they, they really use is... They found out. Yeah. The fuel they w- use is extremely... Um, polluting a lot of it. Um, that's a f- that is uh, regulated by the countries they go to to some extent. But ships at sea, there's no regulation on at least not so far on their. Well, it seems to me to make a lot of sense to use that wind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I should point out that that shipping is extremely inexpensive compared to other forms of transportation. And it may be extremely polluting, but if we sent everything that it goes by ship, by air instead, we'd find that pollution would just go up because we'd be, you know, airplanes pollute a lot. And costs would go up. Yeah. And everything would go up, including the temperature of the world. Okay. I'm going to go to the next piece, if that's all right. Why not? A very interesting picture here. This is an extremely interesting picture. Um, these, these, uh, this is Europe, obviously, or part of it. And the figures... That, it's most, most of Europe, anyhow. Yeah. The figures that you're seeing there are the spot power prices in countries in Europe. And, I, you know, some of them are... Well, the, some of them are kind of weird. For example... 4.5 euros per megawatt hour in Poland is an extremely low price. Yes, it is. Um, I, I would expect that a normal low price for power might be 65 euros per megawatt hour. But look at this. All of the other prices are negative. So they're paying you to take energy. They're, and, in, and in the Netherlands, where... A megawatt of power would usually cost 65 euros, I would guess. They're paying 500 euros to get people to take it. Wow. And topsy- what? It's topsy-turvy. It's topsy-turvy. And this is because of the war in, uh, in Ukraine and uh-huh. the fact that they have been switching from natural gas to wind power and solar power, and they've done it as fast as they possibly could. And this is a a market that has become a little bit chaotic because of that. And the chaos is really good for the consumer. So what do you have? As you saw this, the picture is the spot prices in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. And the article states that, and I quote, negative power prices reveal market is still unprepared to tap on full renewables potential. Yeah, over the weekend, electricity producers on European power exchanges offered to pay up to 500 euros per megawatt hour to anyone taking their electricity. Well, the N or anyone had to be somebody who was buying 
wholesale power. This was not homeowners. Right. Um, the record negative prices reflect the dynamic ch uh, changes brought about by renewable energy. And yes, they did. Okay, we're up to Sunday, July 9th, unless you have more that you want to say about that, Tom. No, I could, I could, I could pass. We got a nice picture of a wind farm here. We do. Let me put it up. There we go. Nice wind farm. Yeah, it's a nice wind farm. And I have no idea where that wind farm is. My guess is that it's either in western United States or Australia. And I would place the bet on western United States. But for no particular reason except that the photographer has a, a um, Spanish-looking name. So what do you well, have? Well, the comes from India, so it could be India. I don't think so, because that picture was one I found. It was not one that came with the article. Um, this is from P. There are a lot of mountains in India. Well, there are in northern India. Yeah, um, this is from PSU Watch. One gigawatt in one quarter. India's wind energy capacity addition sees an unprecedented jump. This was almost unbelievable. I had to read this article twice before I could really understand the numbers. India's installations of wind energy capacity have seen an unprecedented jump in the first quarter of the fiscal um, of the current fiscal year as projects totaling 1.13 gigawatts were installed in the country. This is more installations achieved and more than the installations achieved annually for the last six years. So, so this, this is one quarter. In of one, one quarter year. of the year, they did more than they did in the entirety of any of the previous six years. Wow. And I'm uh, they are changing. What? The times they are a change. Right, and they're doing it at about the same clip now. Yeah. They didn't just do this for the first quarter and then break for a vacation for the rest of the year either. So no, it's pretty impressive work. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to put up the next picture, which is a That's sunset. A I like these these orange skies. Yeah. Jason Blackeye's work is, is uh, photography that I've used before. He's um, very fond of taking pictures of wind turbines. But this particular um, picture is just a sunset. I think so. Yeah. I don't know much about Jason Blackeye, the photographer, but I would guess that he might be American Indian. Uh-huh. I, I remember reading a story about a, a teacher who was reading off the names of the students in the class, and he was new to the class, and he kept calling the name of a person named Blueski, and nobody responded, and he decided that <laughs> Blueski wasn't there. And then after, and he said, is there anybody whose name I didn't call? And he got a person raised his hand and said, my name is Adam Blue Sky. <laughs> Looks like Blue Rescue to me. I yeah. To see him like... making that mistake. Yeah. Okay, this is from CNN. Global heat in uncharted territory. As scientists warn, 2023 could be the hottest year on record. The world I is... Wouldn't bet that. What's that? I wouldn't bet against that. No, I would not. I would bet very much for that. Not that I'm a betting man. I, you know, I, I bet... What did they call it when we were kids? Gentleman's bet? A gentleman's bet has no money attached to it. Uh -huh. The world is blasting through climate records. Oh, yeah. As scientists sound the alarm, the likelihood is growing that 2023 could be the hottest year on record. By a long shot, I would say. And the climate crisis could be altering our weather in ways they don't even understand yet. That's scary. <clears throat> well, yes, it is scary. That's right. It means that we have to do something. I have and seen... We don't know what to do because we don't understand it. Yeah. yeah. I have seen a lot of things, and every once in a while I get kind of despondent because we have to take care of this, and what are we doing? We're, we're putting our attention on a war in Ukraine. And yeah, the war in Ukraine requires a certain level of our attention. Nevertheless, the thing that we really need to do, I think 
is um, two things, one of which is take care of climate change, and the other is figure out a better way to live. Um, but nevertheless, there it is. Okay, I'm going to go on if you don't mind. Let's Whoops. move along. A nice picture of Johannesburg. Johannesburg. And that's what it is. And this is from my broadband. And I have no idea what my broadband is. I didn't really look. The center of that picture looks like an observation tower, doesn't it? It does. And as a matter of fact, I think we're going to see that observation tower again. But I think it's going to be next the next show we have. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, there's a lot going on in South Africa. Um, so, so what do you have for title, Tom? Reduced ESCOM load shedding is here to stay, according to the electricity minister. Yeah. Um, speaking to reporters, the South African electricity minister, and I am not even going to try to pronounce his name. It's <laughs> it's um, it's got it's got too many letters. Um, I, I want to point out, you know, one of my favorite sentences in Welsh is "Pui adi hunu," um, which means "Who is that man?" And the reason I'm so fond of it is because of the spelling. "Pui" is P W Y, "adi" is Y D Y, and "hunu" is H W N N W. Now I have no trouble pronouncing Welsh. But I cannot pronounce this man's ma name. I'm sure he can, and that makes him a better man than I am. Well, it's not Welsh. It's not Welsh. That's the problem. If it were Welsh, I'd have no problem with it. Okay. He said in well, what it's worth, ESCOM is a South African electricity public utility. That's right. He, the, this uh, electricity minister said improvements in the amount of load shedding, shedding are due to the increased energy availability factor and the fact that ESCOM has needed to burn less coal. Now, why has ESCOM needed to burn less coal? Because they're putting in renewable energy. So, you know, it's like skirting the issue of why they don't have to have load shedding. But it means that they don't have to shut down everything several times a day in yeah. order to have enough electricity. Okay, we uh, have to move on, I'm sorry to say. That's an interesting story. Hey, sure. What? It's a nice picture coming up. That's right. It's a picture of daffodils. And daffodils are turning out to have some interesting properties. This is from Nature World News, and you have a title. Daffodils eaten by livestock could address climate change. Wow. Wow. Who'd have thunk? Methane is considered the second most common greenhouse gra gas after carbon dioxide, and it is released by cows and sheep whenever they burp. A report on uh, BBC said that a chemical which can be extra extracted from daffodils could reduce methane production by a third. That is methane production in cattle and sheep. Um, there are other things that do the methane reduction better. But, you know, it's nice to have options. That's pretty interesting, really. It is. Okay, you got more on that? I don't think I do, no. Okay, we have a picture of a salt field in Taiwan. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take your word for that. <laughs> okay, those, those conical-looking things are, are, are piles of salt. And they are in. Is little, that what they are? Huh? Yeah, they're in little areas where they're flooding seawater into those those little areas, and the seawater evaporates, and then they rake up the salt and pile it on that on that pile. And, but, uh, eventually, take it away, I guess. Eventually, they take it away, and this is a traditional way of getting salt in places where you don't have salt mines. So, um, you know, sea salt is, is pretty good stuff uh, in terms of the minerals that it's got for us. And, oh, yeah. And this is from, this article is from CNN, and you have a title for it, I'll betcha. South Korean shoppers hoard salt and seafood ahead of Japan's release of treated radioactive water. Yep. 
For the past month, Korea has struggled with severe sea salt shortages as shoppers snap it up in bulk, reflecting heightened public anxiety ahead of the planned release of treated radioactive water from Fukushima, Japan. So they've got that problem with Fukushima. Yeah. And they're going to solve the problem by releasing the water? They've got, they've got something like 1,200 huge tanks of water. And they don't have any room for new tanks. At least they that's what no they say. They don't have a place to put it. And if they don't extract it, um, it will run straight into the ocean. So uh, what they're trying to do is extract the water from the ground under Fukushima, put it through filters. And this is something that I find fascinating because when I was in high school, we were taught you cannot filter ions out of water. Or anything. And you else. now can. And now you and can. Now. And, you know, they have, um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking diatomaceous earth, but it isn't. It's, um, oh, I forget the product. It wasn't even known when I was, when I was a kid, I don't think. But the, the thing is, they, they have these crystals that can be mined. And the crystals have a lattice that is full of holes. And they can be lattices uh -huh. in many different shapes. There's hundreds of different shapes of these things. And depending upon the lattice, different ions will get stuck in the holes. Uh -huh. So you can actually filter cesium, for example, out of solution. I'll be darned. Amazing. The thing is, you so cannot... Is what, so what we're looking at is it affect a new, new form of salt mine. Uh, no, this is uh, the salt field that we're looking at is is something that's affected down the down the line. They have to get rid of the water. They have got the cesium out. They've got any you know they can take out cesium and strontium and things like that, and the radioactive ions are taken out with it. But the problem is there is tritium still left. Now tritium is, as you know, uh, a form of hydrogen, and they can't. They can't filter that out. They haven't found a way to filter it, filter it out. So the water that they've got is radioactive mostly because it's got tritium in it. And tritium yeah. has a fairly short half-life. It's uh, a few years, as I recall. And what they want to do is they want to filter out all the cesium, all the strontium, and then after a few years of having it sit there um, with a with a tritium decomposing, they want to release that into the environment. And of course, they're releasing it into the into the Pacific Ocean, hundreds of miles. By, from, this, by this time, it's no longer tritium. Well, most of it, yeah. And they're releasing it into a huge body of, of water, and it's diluted before they release it to a point where um, it's below the, the allowable limit. So they're, they're claiming that it's okay. And even the United Nations claims that it's okay. Um, but, you know, Korean shoppers are very upset about this. I personally uh, am not very upset about it. And I would, I would eat, you know, uh, I'd eat Tha uh, sea salt from Taiwan after it was, uh, Japanese had been releasing it for years, or from Korea, or, for, you know, food from those areas, I don't think I would worry about it much. But they are worried. Now, I will tell you that I'm profoundly anti-nuclear energy, but I'm also not in favor of fear. And I think that we should be realistic about these things. So I, I'm not taking a position against their release. I'm, and I know that there's probably people out there saying, oh, George, how can you do that? Anyway. We should go on, shouldn't we, Tom? One point about nuclear energy, it is expensive. Oh, And expensive. it's not going to get less expensive. So in the future, you're not going to see a heck of a lot of nuclear energy. I absolutely agree. And anybody who's curious about that should look at the stuff that, um, that Next Era Energy released last October to its stockholders explaining why it is going to spend zero in, on nuclear energy in the next 10 years. They, by the way, own seven nuclear power plants. So I think they know about nuclear energy. Anyway, we do have to go on. Our next item is from right BBC. Nautilus. We have a Nautilus. And by the way, that is not science fiction that we're looking at. It's not a picture of an artist's conception of something that 
existed uh, 500 million years ago. That is a photograph of an actual living thing. And I Some think, kind of a snail, isn't it? Well, it looks like a snail, except that it also looks a little bit like an octopus or something. It's kind of like yeah, an octopus. Yeah, it's got a lot of tentacles. Yeah, it, it's an octopus with a shell that looks like a snail shell. And it's not really an octopus. It has more tentacles than that. But anyway, this is from the BBC. It's a, it's a kind of a weird animal. Um, Crunch? Yeah. Nope. What were you saying, what were you saying for it's, a stencil? It's kind of a weird animal. Yeah, I'll buy that. <laughs> yeah? Crunch talks do a deep sea mining controversy. Yeah. At Global Talks in Jamaica, deep sea mining will be one of the hot topics. Scientists fear a possible gold rush for precious metals on the ocean floor could have devastating effects um, on marine life. But supporters argue that these minerals are needed if the world is to meet demand for green technologies. Um, We've talked about these minerals before. We have, yes. And they're, they're, you know, it, it's interesting that when you've got hundreds of millions of years of a spot being on the seafloor, you, you, the, the minerals kind of collect. They, they, you know, build out. They are attracted, like is, uh, like is attracted to like, and these minerals... Well, they're easy to pick up. They're easy to pick up. You can pick up nodules of, of nickel and, you know, stuff like that. And my feeling on this is mining on the seafloor, I think, might be very much cleaner and less damaging to the environment than mining in West Virginia. I mean, you don't have to remove... Almost like mining with a vacuum cleaner. Almost, Yeah. But, you know, this is something that I could be wrong about that. And this is something that has to be considered. That round thing on that guy looks to me like it's an eye. But looks like it. Yeah, I'm going to put that back up so people can see. Just a little to the left of the center of the shell is a thing that looks like a cat's eye. And I think, it actually, like it. <laughs> I think it's an eye. Yeah. So there it is. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we are up to Tuesday, July 11th, and uh, we have an item from the BBC. Oh, come on, let's scroll. Here we go. Lightning. Looks oh, like lightning to me. Up lightning for the, for the people watching the show. There we go. Yeah. What do you got for a title, Tom? How harvesting electricity from human air could one day power our devices. Yes. Wow. It's an idea that's been around for many years. Nikola Tesla and others have investigated it in the past, but never achieved promising results. However, that could be about to change. Research groups around the world are finding ways to glean electricity from humid air. Now that's interesting. Isn't it? The idea here is that the air, when it's humid, builds up an electric charge, and lightning is a result. Well, you don't have to build it until you get a lightning bolt. You can build it until you get a little spark, you know, kind of like what you get when you shuffle your shoes across the shaggy uh, carpet and then touch somebody's arm. Yeah, that was great fun when I was a kid. Oh, was it ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should we, should we go on, Tom? Get it. Okay, we have a picture of an ambulance. That's what it looks like to me. Yep. And what yeah, is it? 2,000 people died from record breaking heat in Europe last summer. Yeah. It's a lesson for us, too. That's right. <laughs> Nearly 62,000 people died heat related deaths last year during Europe's hottest summer on record. Well, this year might turn out to be the hottest summer, too. A yeah, study like published in Nature Medicine found this. It is heartbreaking evidence that, a, that heat is a silent killer and its victims are greatly undercounted. This is from CNN. And I noticed that heat is one of the, one of the most common uh, causes of death. Um, you know... It's, you don't normally think of it, but you're absolutely right. It is, it is the most common cause of heat-related, of uh, weather-related death. And last summer in Europe was horrible. 
but they've been having a horrible summer this year too, as has North Africa and China and the United States and just about anybody else in the Northern Hemisphere. So what can we do? Okay. But, let me, come on, will you scroll? For, there we go. There we go. <laughs> now we know that Tom is in so business. at work. Yeah, and this is from Clean Technica. Better batteries from Lawrence Berkeley Lab Research. A research team led by Gao Liu, a senior, and that's probably pronounced wrong because I have no idea how to pronounce Chinese, a senior um, uh, scientist from the energy technologies area at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And in fact, I'm not even sure that is Chinese, but I suspect it is. That research team published a paper in the journal Nature Energy recently in which they report a new technology that could lower the cost of lithium ion batteries and extend their service life. And the person, I didn't look this one up, but I should have, because that's very interesting. Oh yeah. That person, by the way, who is who has got her hand on the on the computer mouse, I think might be uh, Gao Liu. Uh-huh. So um, that's what it is. I, I uh, did not follow what they were doing with this. And, you know, clean, it's in Clean Technica, but it's, I, it's just more that is coming on batteries. Well, there's a lot of technology that's in the works that we haven't heard about yet. Yep. Some of it is going to really bring fruit. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now we've got a picture of a flood in Vermont. And uh, we are up to Wednesday, July 12th. Uh, what? Looks like it to me. Yeah, uh, that picture, by the way, is not from this year. It's from several years ago. But I suspect, Where is it? I don't know. It looks like, it looks like a Vermont town, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it sure Great. does. I mean, you yes, know. Yes, where, it is, so it probably is. Vermont is not the only place where church steeples tend to tilt slightly. I will tell you that. So. Uh-huh. You notice I didn't the, notice that, but you're right. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this is from the BBC. And the BBC took that picture because of the tilting uh, steeple, I think, because they want to show how Americans are kind of crazy. Well, here's the title. U.S. Storms. Vermont governor calls Florida historic and catastrophic. The, the floods are. Vermont has suffered, quote, historic and catastrophic, end quote, flash flooding. The governor said after up to two months worth of rain fell in two days. That's hard rain. Over 100 rescues have been conducted by emergency crews in the state, and over 100 roads were closed because of inundation. And you know, Tom, I had several people call, and other people I know had similar experiences. They, they've had people call and asking, are you okay? Is everything okay up there? You know, I've, I've been reading about these floods in Vermont. And, you know, I'd walk down to the co-op and, and walk across the, the uh, bridge to the, to the, uh, um, over the Whetstone Brook and see, yeah, the Whetstone Brook was really high, and there was a lot of water pouring down that bro bro brook, but it was nothing compared to Hurricane Irene. I mean, Hurricane Irene, the, the, the road bridge over the brook ha was getting splashed. Well, I, I lost a car at Irene. Yeah, I, I remember that you said that. And that was just, that was uh, amazing. This was bad in Brattleboro. Other parts of the state, uh, the 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 flooding was horrible, horrible. Well, we we here in Brattleboro almost missed the rain entirely. It just wasn't raining here. It was not it, raining not. anywhere near as much as it was in other places. So we lucked out, but other parts of Vermont did not. And um, what's going on? What? It's still going on. Yeah, well, sort of. This has been a very weird year because we've had. Um, we've had uh, storms that we've had storms that just dumped huge amounts of water on us, and then after a couple of days they'd disappear, and we'd have one or two days of really steamy hot uh, sunny weather, 
and then all of a sudden we'd have heavy rain again. And that has been a pattern that has been going on. Um, I will say I'd rather have that than what they have in Phoenix, where it's been over 110 degrees for the last two weeks straight. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a hot weather person. I'm, I, I prefer rain to bright sunshine. I'm w one of those weird kind of... I wouldn't say I prefer rain, but I'm not a hot weather person I am not, Yeah, I'm, I mean, Vermont is a good place for me. I've lived in New Hampshire, too. New Hampshire is a good place for me. Okay, should we go on? Can't dance. Okay, we have a picture of a storm. Looks like a lightning bolt to me. Well, there's a lightning bolt in the storm, but, and yep. you'll notice if you look at the road, the middle of the road is in shadow, but the shadow is because of a vehicle, and the sunshine is coming behind the vehicle and lighting up both sides of the road. Oh, that's interesting. Isn't it? So this is a storm that's in the distance, and the sun is shining behind. That's a good setup for a rainbow, but in this case, what we're seeing is a lightning bolt. Um, this is from CNN. A perfect storm unfolding this summer is supercharging the weather. Yeah, a perfect storm, a perfect storm in quotes, is unfolding this sun, summer as atmospheric ingredients combine to create record-breaking weather. So if you're curious about what's going on outside, it's called weather. As the Arctic temperatures rise faster than the warm areas, the reduced difference can make the jet stream get stuck, prolonging weather events. Now, this is a really interesting situation. The, the Arctic and, and, of course, also the Antarctic are warming up very fast. Areas in the tropics are not warming up so much. They're warming, but just a little. And that means that the temperatures in the Arctic are getting a little closer to the temperatures in the, in the tropics. Now, there's still a big difference. You know, you're, we're, we're talking about the difference maybe between 40 degrees and 90 degrees instead of the difference between 15 degrees and 88 degrees or something like that. But because the difference is less, the, um, the jet stream is, the jet stream position is getting stuck. And that means that the barriers between colder weather and warmer weather don't move. And when those barriers don't move, the uh, weather gets very um, boring, or in terms well, of the, what kind the of water change. temperatures rise, the yeah. air temperature yeah. dries. Yes, and warmer air is more produced, productive of storms. That's true. And when I said boring, by the way, I meant that it it is being it, it's getting to be the more the same day after day, and um, that's not necessarily lightning is not boring. I don't think, but if you, you know. <laughs> Yeah. I almost got hit by lightning once. I did. You did get hit, huh? I did get hit. I was walking up the basement stairs in my home in New Hampshire. Yeah. And I was walking in the street in the Bronx and yeah. Uh, yeah. lightning hit the building hit hit the building next to me and left a big scar on it. It it was less than ten feet away. Yeah, and that that is scary. I've see, I saw that happen when I was uh, with a friend of mine in the living room uh, next door, and the woman who, who owned the house was walking in the door, and lightning hit, it was only about five feet from her, and it left a round black spot about a foot across on the lawn. Wow. And she was scared. Um, well, it, this just scared the bejesus out of me, I'll tell you that. I'm not surprised. Um, I was n not scared by when I got hit by lightning. It was I, that was very weird lightning. It was um, I've never seen lightning like like this before or since. The our, the meadow around our house was being hit by bolts of lightning that were striking maybe every t five to ten seconds. Wow! And th when I looked down the hill, I could see that the tops of lightning bolts were below me. These bolts were maybe sixty feet long. Wow. But they were strong enough that when one of them hit an ash tree, it blew up. 
<laughs> there were that's kind of exciting. Yeah, there were splinters of that ash tree that were like two and a half inches thick and five feet long. And wow. I, I ran into the basement, uh, through the basement door of the house and thought, wow, I'm safe and started up the stairs and lightning hit the chimney. And from the chimney, it jumped to, um, I think it was a washing machine came down, um, uh, the water pipes, um, came out of the pipe, went through my legs, or I, I should say through my pants. I think most of it was conducted by the water on my pants and um, because I was out in the rain and then into a, into a, a lolly column and uh, out. And uh, it, was a, it was quite an experience. Okay, we should go. I think we've got one more story. Yeah, this is our last picture, a nice picture of Judd Curry. Yeah, which I should point out is from 2016. It's an old picture. But this item is from CNN. Let me scroll down so I can read it. <laughs> U.S. Climate Energy, U.S. Climate Envoy, John Kerry, set to travel to Beijing this weekend. Yeah, and as we're speaking, he is, he is there. He has been there. U.S. Climate Envoy, uh, John Kerry, is, about, is set to travel to Beijing this weekend for climate talks with his counterparts in China, a Biden administration official told CNN. The meeting comes as the U.S. and China seek ways to work together on the climate crisis. And well, it is a climate crisis. We got to realize that. Yeah, we do. It, you know, we've got a problem and we've got to address the pro problem. And um, in addressing it, it's recognizing it. And there's so many people out there that are denying it. Yeah, they're, or they're saying, yeah, the climate is changing, but it's not man-made, which is a good way to keep the fossil fuels industries going. And, of course, the fossil fuels industries are paying people to say that. And some of the people that they're... It's an asset, you know? It's an asset, that's right. And um, it is... I don't know. I, you know, the, the climate is a problem. We have to deal with it. If we don't deal with it, we're not going to have a future. So I'm going to invite everybody to, to uh, think about that. And in the meantime, our last... Climate is like the long-term effects of weather. That's right. Weather is what happens every day, and climate is what happens over a long period That's of right. time. That's right. That's right. Weather is what you see when you look out the window. Climate is what you think about when you think about weather all over your lifetime. So... We were, uh, see, it was some pretty interesting stuff this week. Yep. And we are, I have my last slide up, which is, says, have a mystifyingly gorgeous week. Mystifyingly gorgeous? Wow. M mystifyingly gorgeous. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and so what I'm, do you think? I'm waving goodbye. I happen to it's know. Right, but my cat Tom is not. Is, your cat is not? No. I'll is have the, to talk to him. Is the cat even around? I don't know where he is, no. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Okay, well, I want to tell you, Tom, that our, our finger limes are producing finger limes. And our, oh, we've got, we've got trees that are just wonderful. Our fig trees, some of our fig trees are producing figs. And our finger limes are making finger limes here in Brattleboro. I didn't know what you were saying. Finger. Yeah, you have a nice little setup there where you live. Yeah, that's right. So, everybody, come back next time. Tom will say that better than I. You all come back and see us now, you hear? That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. 